This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. This chapter looks at corporate governance, corporate social responsibility, and ethics. First of all, corporate governance, uh, which is really asking how companies are directed and controlled. And the problem uh, arises because once a, a company in a way becomes more than just a family a company, uh, the shareholders are the owners of the company, uh, but they take very little to do with the day-to-day -day running of the company. Instead, it is the directors who look after the day-to-day -day management and running of the company. Within this relationship, the directors are uh, known as the agents, and the shareholders are known as the principals. And this legal relationship uh, implies or says, if you like, that the agents should run the company in the best interest of the principals. Directors should run the company in the best interest of the shareholders. The trouble is, if the shareholders are not in the company every day, may never visit the company, and the directors are there every day, how do the <coughs> shareholders know that the directors are actually running the company for the shareholders' benefit and not the directors' benefit. And there were a number of scandals where it was discovered that directors were, for example, awarding themselves outrageously large um, remuneration packages, uh, very nice cars, first class travel, where the directors were maybe uh, making decisions that uh, were very risky for the company, but uh, the people who were really suffering the risk were the shareholders of the company went bad, uh, whereas the directors kept getting paid. There were a number of scandals, and after scandals there are, as always after these uh, uh, events, various reports and hand-wringings and government investigations and so on. And the, the subject of the kind of corporate governance came up in importance. And what we're going to be looking at here is the UK Corporate Governance Code. Uh, this is used as just an example of best practice for corporate governance. Different countries have got their own approaches to this, but, but to a large extent they, 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 they follow fairly similar ground, although they make it there slightly differently. So the UK Corporate Governance Code breaks uh, corporate governance into five headings. First of all, there is leadership. It's effectively saying that leadership of the company should be by a, a board of directors who have got people of the kind of right quality on it, uh, and that the CEO and the uh, chairman should be separate. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Effectiveness. Uh, the board needs a, a wide range of ability. In particular, uh, the board needs to have on it what are called non-executive directors. It needs a balance of these people, people who don't have day-to-day -day jobs in the company, but who are on the board to give advice and to observe, maybe to issue warnings. Accountability, uh, the uh, doings of the company, the results of the company, uh, must be uh, reported properly to shareholders. The directors must be held accountable uh, if things don't go well. Uh, they must be reviewed, for example. The remuneration of the directors should be reasonable. doesn't mean it should be minimised, but it means that for the size of the company and the skills and competences needed, uh, you should pay a reasonable remuneration uh, but not an outrageous remuneration. And then there is relationships with shareholders. To some extent in corporate governance, shareholders were their own worst enemies. Uh, they would not turn up at AGMs. They would take nothing to do with the running of the company at all. And they were kind of surprised when the company went bad. It is uh, part of the director's duties to try and encourage shareholders to be more active to send out regular updates and trading reports and so on about how the 
companies getting on, try to encourage people to come to the AGM and to participate in really what's the management of that company. In the United States, uh, the corporate governance uh, approach is what's known as compliance based. It is law. Uh, you have to, in a way, sign off uh, checklists. Both the directors and, say, the auditors have to sign off checklists that certain things have happened, certain things haven't happened, and so on. Uh, and the jailers are waiting you, uh, potentially, if you do this incorrectly. In UK and in most of Europe, it is what's known as principles-based. You don't have checklists to go through, but there are broad principles involved, uh, and uh, it, the onus is on the directors to ensure that these principles are followed. And rather than ha having it law, statute law, uh, in uh, the UK certainly, uh, good corporate governance has to be followed by listed companies and that's enforced by the stock exchange, it's not enforced by the law. So if you're a listed company and you don't comply with the corporate government governance rules, then the stock exchange will want to know why and as a last resort your shares could be suspended on the stock exchange so they can't be bought or sold. The approach in most of Europe is this comply or explain. Comply with the rules of corporate governance or else give a very good explanation of why you haven't complied. So what are the main elements coming? We had these these five areas up here, leadership, effectiveness, accountability, remuneration, relationship, shareholders. Uh, in effect, when it comes to, 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 to the event, the, the main points are, first of all, the board. We need to split the role of the chairman and the chief executive officer. What was found in, in the scandals when companies went bad is you had one person who is both CEO and the chairman and that was too much power in the hands of this person. And if they were a very charismatic, bullying type of big boss type of person, then they could lead the company astray. They would bully other directors. Uh, before the board meeting, they'd go around, maybe the directors kind of individually, and say, you know, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, I want you to do something else. And then in the board meeting, it was more rubber stamping what this CEO person had already kind of decided. Now it is to be split at the top. The CEO looks after the running of the company. The chair or the chairman looks after the conduct of the board meetings, making sure the agenda is appropriate, making sure everyone has a proper say, uh, making sure there's a proper vote at the end, and making sure that the uh, CEO doesn't push through measures which really the directors aren't keen on. Non-executive directors. Non-executive directors, there has to be a balance of non-executive directors, which means at least 50% of the board uh, has to be made up of non-executive directors. These are people with skills and ability, but they don't take part in the day-to-day -day running of the company. Uh, they can be therefore more independent. Uh, their remuneration mustn't depend on the profits of the company. So they're sitting there watching and voting at board uh, meetings, giving advice, giving warnings uh, to the executive directors. And these non-executive directors may, for example, uh, uh, stop the uh, executive directors uh, 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 embarking on a, a course of action which is regarded as being too risky. The uh, non-executive directors uh, form a number of uh, subcommittees. Remuneration committee looks after the pay of the directors. The audit committee looks after relationships with both the internal and the external auditors. And the nomination committee looks after the appointment of new directors. Uh, what you want to, to do if you want a new director is you should advertise and try and get the best person. 
the way it maybe tended to be done under the old system was that directors would appoint friends or acquaintances uh, to be uh, perhaps rather quiet, well-behaved directors rather than having the right skills and being a bit more questioning. And then there is reporting. Uh, it's a requirement that you report that the corporate governance has been properly fulfilled and so on. Report that to the shareholders. Corporate social responsibility. To what extent should the interest of uh, uh, stakeholders other than shareholders be taken into account? account? In many ways, the, the, the legal nicety says that companies should be run for the benefit of shareholders, but to what extent should we take into account the stakeholders like employees, stakeholders like customers, stakeholders like competitors even, uh, uh, stakeholders like the government. How sh can we extend, or should we indeed extend away, from just looking after shareholders? It's difficult. Uh, obviously good PR comes, good public relation comes. If a company can say, look, we've given money to charity, we have subsidised a local hospital, uh, we are giving employees one day a week off to work for charity, or whatever it's going to be, uh, you get very good PR from that. Uh, but to what extent should a lot of money be spent by Shell, by, 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 by the company, uh, on, in a way, non-profit making pursuits, more charitable pursuits? And we have to be a little bit careful about it. First of all, profit is itself a good thing. Companies making profits give more stable employment. Companies making profits can afford to expand. Companies making profits can afford to do more research and development. Companies making profits will pay more corporation tax. Uh, and anything which maybe detracts from profits is, is maybe putting, uh, shall we say, risk in, in, in the way of certain desirable outcomes. Secondly, uh, instead of a company uh, perhaps making donations to charities or doing good works, why don't shareholders do it themselves? Maybe give them bigger dividends and if the shareholder wants to support a particular charity then they can choose what it is and how much to give. If the company is supporting a charity, uh, how do we decide which charities to give the money to? How much should be given? What is the authority uh, to be giving to your favourite charity if you're a director, when if you didn't do that, really this is dividend going to companies, go going to shareholders. Uh, so the decision about the beneficiaries is also slightly obscure. I think I mean this is this is corporate social responsibility is a very uh, kind of a um, common, uh, 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 I suppose, a very, very common thing for, for companies to be kind of proclaiming it and to be kind of shouting about it and to be proud of and maybe rightly but once it becomes more than good PR then there are perhaps real difficulties in its legality in deciding the beneficiaries uh, and giving money to a, a cause where maybe the, the appropriate person to be giving money to a cause is the government through corporation tax rather than companies themselves. Ethics, however, is vital. Good ethical behaviour is vital in a company. First of all, it reduces risk. If you uh, behave unethically, be sure you'll be found out. And when you are found out, uh, then there will be hell to pay. Uh, if, if you are discovered, for example, to have covered up unethical behaviour, and once one breach of ethics has been discovered, people say, well, what else have they been up to that's been covered up and so on? So uh, it, it reduces risk and because risk is reduced, legal penalties are going to be less and, and so on. And there people will be willing to lend you money for less interest rates because you are a less risky company. Lower returns are required by shareholders because again, you are a, a, a safer bet less risky companies. Uh, more collaboration with other good companies is 
is likely. Why would a good company want to collaborate with a company which has had a history of bad events, bad ethics, unethical behaviour? You probably manage to recruit better employees, uh, and and the good name, the good will of the company, if you like, is likely to attract more sales. People would rather buy from an ethical company and be employed by an ethical company and collaborate with an ethical company than doing any of these things with a company which is regarded as being unethical, dishonest, unpleasant, not caring what harm maybe comes to their customers. Just very, very quickly, we'll look at what's meant by uh, public interest. Uh, companies may have to act in the public interest. Uh, and what we're looking at in, in the public interest, whether it's, it's a company or a firm of accountants and so on uh, here, is we should be trying to act uh, in relation to uh, all stakeholders. The public is all stakeholders. So if you're thinking of yourself as an auditor, you should be acting in the public interest. It's important to the public that you report fairly or ensure the company reports fairly and truly on its financial statements. If you don't carry out an audit properly and inflated profits are reported, then uh, bad decisions are going to be made. Uh, the information is unreliable. We don't know how to judge the performance of that company and so on. Uh, and, and if you cannot believe the information, financial information being reported by companies, there's going to be much less economic certainty. Is it a safe bet? Should I put my pension money in there? Uh, are they actually going to be able to be sustainable employers for the next five years? To promote ethical behaviour, it's important for management to try to promote ethical behaviour, we need openness, trust and honesty. So if there's an ethical dilemma, for example, discuss it with someone. If you've made an ethical mistake, own up to it. Don't try to cover it up. That is not ethical behaviour of any sort. Show respect to the various stakeholders involved. So, so don't try to cheat customers. Don't try to cheat employees. Don't be unfair and bullying on employees and so on. Empower people to come forward uh, uh, to say, if they're worried about something, I do not think this is a, a proper way to proceed for this company. I've got some, some, some qualms about it that I'm not too, too happy about. Uh, and accountability. If you do something wrong, own up to it. Don't try to pass the buck to somebody else. Many companies nowadays issue corporate codes of ethics. Uh, and you'll see in the notes, we have an excerpt there from Amazon's corporate code of ethics, stating out how you should treat suppliers, customers, government, competitors, um, you stay away from bribes and so on, be honest and so on, to promote ethical behaviour, to reduce risk and to increase the likelihood that the, uh, the sustainability of the business. So there we have a corporate code of ethics. It will cover things like equal opportunities, bullying, use of the internet during working time, bribery, money laundering, uh, product safety recalls and so on. You know, don't, don't wait till somebody out there is injured if you discover that a product is unsafe recall them. Uh, you know, every company makes errors, but the ones who get really hammered are the ones who try to cover up the errors and hope they go away. It's important that there's an emphasis on ethical value and that from the very top, directors take this seriously, that they're not just paying lip service to it all. Sometimes there will be ethical conflict. An example of an ethical conflict is, should we close down this factory and move it somewhere else? And there may be very good reasons to move it somewhere else. Perhaps, uh, you know, where your factory is, uh, uh, houses have been built around it, the, it's very difficult to get 
toured by road transport and so on. They had a lot of congestion and so on. So I'm going to move from the centre of the city. I'm going to move it somewhere else. And there could be very good reasons for doing that. But of course, there's an ethical dimension to it because the people employed in that factory may now be out of a job. Uh, and so there is an ethical kind of conflict. It's maybe going to be better for the long-term health of the company and maybe for the local population if we move the factory away, but it's going to be bad for the people employed in the factory because they're going to be losing their jobs. So what we need to look at here, we need to consider the facts. Who is going to be uh, affected? What are the ethical principles involved? You know, it's losing jobs, but it's maybe reducing pollution in that particular area. Uh, what are the fundamental principles? I mean, are we being honest? Are, are, are we doing this? Uh, uh, you know, can we at the bottom of it find a good ethical reason for doing it? What are the relevant internal procedures? And that might be asking for, do you want to move with the factory? Uh, do we have volunteers for redundancy before we get on to compulsory redundancy and so on? Is there any way we can reduce the, the adverse effects from people? Consider alternative courses of action. So one thing we could do with our employees if we're moving the factory is to say, right, we will give you lots of financial help to move. Uh, we will uh, help you get your children to local schools if you move and so on. We will give you maybe additional training uh, uh, if you move uh, and so on. So there are different course of action. You have to think, do I need to move all of the factory or can I just you know, move some of it? There's, there's often, it's often not absolutely cut and dried what you have to do. And then you consider the consequences of each course of action. There'd be pros and cons, good aspects, bad aspects to it. You're, you're, you're not necessarily get to an answer which is guaranteed to be perfectly correct. A lot of ethical dilemmas, there, there are arguments in a number of different sides. If you're unhappy with it, if you're happy with what's decided, let's say getting away from moving the factory, you think there's a, a product that's maybe got some safety aspects uh, uh, with it, uh, uh, and the, the kind of way that it's come down is that the, the, the company thinks, well, the safety risks are so small, we're not actually going to withdraw it there, yeah. and you remain unhappy with that. There's an ethical conflict. What you should do is raise the matter internally. Uh, talk to people. How have you come to that uh, conclusion and so on? Uh, maybe escalate it a little bit uh, w within the organization. Take it to your boss's boss uh, and so on if you're, you're really unhappy about some of that. What you can do then is raise it externally. Uh, so you can go and get professional advice, legal advice as to maybe what should be done. Uh, professional bodies, uh, ACCA for example, will uh, offer uh, advice on certain ethical conflicts and so on, as will legal uh, advisors. In the UK there is now protection for whistleblowers, uh, in other words uh, reporting some problem publicly. And protection is there, you know, if it's if, if what you're reporting is a potential, uh, for example, a danger to the public, or if the company is breaking the law, then there's protection given, provided you do this for, for the proper reasons, if you do it in good faith. And if you remain very unhappy, then what you might have to do is to leave, uh, to cease association with the matter or the company uh, causing the problem. Now that could be easier said than done because of course you will be leaving a company, you're leaving employment, you're leaving a regular salary. Uh, and we're talking here where you really can't live easily with your conscience. Uh, you may simply have to go.